Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Cosmere Conversations. Conversations. Welcome back, everyone. We are coming down to the last couple of days without Stormlight Archive 4 in the universe. Couple of days is an exaggeration, but I understand. The excitement is too real. It's It's coming up seemingly very soon. You could conceivably make a calendar, like a a countdown clock. Maybe like, what are we, 90 days out? Yeah, something like that. That's a thing that. that people could do, that you could have a little, you know, indicator on your website or your whatever we're almost to the end of the cosmere drought everyone the oasis is in sight yeah not just the oasis but like the high storm of water that we have just been (laughs) waiting to hit us uh it's like if these risharians went without a storm for a whole year that next year the first one on the next year they would just be like this is perfect everyone's just going to go outside and bathe it'll be great (laughs) We are coming to you today not to break down the Stormlight Archive books, but instead to talk about the Call to Adventure board game that features the first three books of the Stormlight Archive. It's amazing. That's our official recommendation podcast over. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's it. So this was a (laughs) Kickstarter campaign that began earlier this year. We'll call it mid-quarantine. and It had been in the works for a while. Originally, they thought that it was just going to be a uh, bonus pack, add-on pack to the regular Call to Adventure game. And then over time, it developed and they turned it into its very own standalone Stormlight Archive game. So that is probably the best part and the greatest change that you did not have to invest in the original Call to Adventure game that this is just by itself, comes in a box, everything you need to play. And it is beautiful. The box is beautiful. All of the details are amazing. You will love it. I think that is the hardest thing to describe in an auditory fashion is just how the visuals of this game the artwork that they had done and there were multiple artists uh that developed the cards and the different pieces that we'll talk about in a little bit the cards are gorgeous and so certainly we will not be able to adequately explain how beautiful and just like true works of art these game pieces are and you'll have to go out and check that we'll throw up some links but we don't have like full this is your teaser trailer exactly so you're gonna have to do a little bit of research in this episode and basically put together our words with some of the things that you're able to find online i mean really you don't even need to look at it just click buy now That's (laughs) (laughs) that's all you need to know no thinking required yeah what we're gonna do in this episode is to talk about kind of a general overview of the game and how it works to try to give really just a a taste. This is not going to be a detailed breakdown of like, this is how you play each step of the game. Definitely those exist. We've checked some out, uh, but they work better on YouTube. And I highly encourage uh, if you're interested in kind of a playthrough to go check that. This is just more of a review, our thoughts. General impressions. Basically trying to create more people who have this game in their homes so that we can create just a worldwide span of amazing game players. I wanted to do this episode also because as sort of a baby gamer, I was unsure if I would really be able to get into this game. I was like a little bit worried that it was going to be too complex and I wasn't going to be ready for it. So if you two are feeling like, I don't know if I can play this game, seems complicated. Um, I'm here to say that never fear. It is not. There are quite a few 
details to the game to sort of keep in your mind, but I have found it fairly easy to pick up and start playing. Which is a great point because I think that board games, tabletop games, card games that this falls more into, they do have the danger of basically becoming too complex where then it's impossible to be kind of a casual player. You really just have to like go all in and spend like, I don't know, maybe 10 games plus like really understanding everything. And this game, and I think the we could just say broadly about the call to adventure style, does allow for people to be easily introduced to the game. But I want to say that I would probably rate this as like a medium to advanced board game. Complexity. Yeah, and just yeah. in terms of complexity, just in I mean, terms of the did. things that you have to keep track of and the importance of multiple playthroughs. The whole game is yeah. meant to be played an abundant number of times. Yeah, and I think that's a great thing to bring up here also that I feel like the gameplay... Um, for, you know, the money that you spend, like the reward that you get is really high. It has high potential for many, many playthroughs. Um, there are different quests that you can play each time. You can choose to play co-op or competitive. There's a bunch of different sort of choices that you can make throughout the game and like at the outset that enables you to continue playing the game over and over again and it kind of always feels different and fresh and there's a bunch of different permutations that you can put together to have a different experience each time. So basically if you are feeling overwhelmed by the number of options and kind of maybe tactics or strategies that you're trying to think of that is by design, they're giving you lots of choices to add to the complexity and the replayability of the game. And I think that that's important to say up front. Uh, and then let's just kind of trust that the listeners can make their own decisions. Yeah. I mean, if you're curious about sort of like time investment, we did spend maybe 30 to say, 45 yeah. minutes. 30 to 60 minutes yeah. with more people. It takes longer basically is how yeah. I would. Well, and I was going to say, we just spent a while like reading the rule book and sort of like introducing ourselves to the game before starting play. So I think there is a little bit of a time investment up front. You can't just like open it and immediately start playing. It's not checkers. Yeah, not checkers. <laughs> it's not even chess. Let's go into <laughs> what it is though. And that <sighs> is a game that is built on creating a character, a hero, a radiant. Which is amazing. If you, like us, probably most of you, have always wanted to just put yourself inside of a Stormlight Archive book and like do some of the things that the characters do and like live those lives, live yeah. in that world. And this kind of does feel like that, which is really great. It definitely does. Now you can choose your path, choose your own adventure. That's the whole point of the game. But what you just said, I think is its greatest calling card. We had also released at the exact same time for probably not coincidental reasons. Oh, yeah, it was definitely the for this. Stormlight Archive Radiant quiz that was, you know, a hot buzz for a minute uh, was, I think, a great kind of reminder what this game is for. It's to put yourself in the shoes of different characters from the Stormlight Archive and then allow you to play in the world in a very unique way. It's even set up in a story-like fashion. So you play through um, a three-act story basically a three act structure the cards are laid out that way and everything where you have the first part of your story where your character is like just starting out and your challenges are a little bit easier and then you get into act two which is you know the meat of your story challenges get a little bit harder then you graduate to act three where like the really big events start happening super challenging uh challenges to face and that scaling difficulty where each act becomes more and more difficult 
also becomes more rewarding for your character as well. So your character grows in strength as you progress and move through the story in similar ways that we are familiar with our characters getting kind of power-ups or boost after they say ideals. There are similar power-ups and boosts that come within the game. One of them is actually saying the next ideal, <laughs> and you advance and get a boost in power if you play that card in the right moment. I'll say too, part of the accessibility, I think, of this game is that there are sort of multiple facets to it. For example, there are three different sort of endings or ways to wrap up the game. One is a final challenge against Odium where you fight Odium and lose or defeat him. Two is you can tally up various points for certain things throughout the game and have that sort of competitiveness between you and the other players to see who won, who got the most points. And then three is that you all tell your stories based on the cards that you've gotten throughout the game. You sort of put together all of these cards and make up your own character story, the story of your life as this person. So if you are feeling sort of uh, intimidated by the complexity of the game, you can always just focus on one of those things. Like if you decide that you don't really care about the point totals and you just want to build a beautiful story for yourself, you can do that. And I think that that's definitely something that adds to the replayability because there are different motivations that you yourself as a player can have going into the game. For example, I'll just talk about our very last game. I did something abnormal for me, which was to very purposefully try to create an exact representation of a character from the book. In this case, <laughs> just because of the first cards that I was dealt, I got something that was like, oh, this could set me on the path to being Zeth, Sun Sun Villano. And by the end of the game, I had hit like all of these different markers that made me a skybreaker and made me both face and then serve nail the herald of justice and so like my character arc was very purposefully designed like i didn't take a path that would lead me away from that instead i kept doubling <laughs> down on like justice yeah. and trying even to though there were cards that like would have worked for you or that like may have given you certain boosts or whatever you just went for your story cards the story that you wanted to tell exactly that particular game for me was more about trying to just create the character as I remembered it from the page as much as possible. Yeah. And it was really fun. And so there is a little bit of randomness when the game begins and you are dealt your origin cards. But then from that point on, it really is how what's the overall goal of the game and then what's your individual goal. And then I think that's why we have played it so many times already and why we see the replayability as being so high is just you can bring whatever you want to the game you can play different for example brooke destroys me in points every <laughs> single time like we've won and we've lost against odium but every single time brooke gets way more points than i'm me. really good at collecting all the things yeah exactly so there's just like all these like little things that you can collect to either make your character more powerful or go down a certain path. And Brooke just always is like hitting the little, <laughs> you've collected three things and that's more at the times two bonus. I got the icons, I got the runes, I got the virtue points. And so that's what I think is really great about this game is that it has that built-in flexibility. Totally. Part of that flexibility comes on the individual scale when you are playing and having these options that are put in front of you, you as a player really have a lot that you're trying to keep track of and yes. to balance or to boost. Um, and so there's definitely some difficulty in your first playthrough, your first couple of playthroughs. Yeah. Not, I mean, I think you can play, you know, but as you continue to play like multiple times, you definitely get better at keeping track of all those things and like maximizing the things you can do. You know, there were certain 
aspects of the game that I feel like we didn't really utilize or access the first couple of times. But now that we're more used to it, it's like, oh, yeah, I can, you know, pay this, you know, money to do this certain thing. And that might help me. Things like that. Yeah. As I was mentioning with my character of Zeth, there was a benefit to kind of going all in a certain direction, the Skybreaker justice route. I got specific perks that were working together throughout my three-act structure that by the end I was a very, very powerful character because all of those things were working and flowing together. Now, I've also played differently, and I just want to kind of talk about maybe some individual playthroughs that we've had is a kind of more jack of all trades yeah and try to have a broad base and specifically this comes in the form of the different rune icons that you Their are abilities they represent your abilities as a character exactly okay so the abilities are charisma strength intelligence wisdom constitution and dexterity and you have probably the ability to collect two to three yeah three is the max yes of how strong your ability can be just like there's three acts in the game there are three levels to any ability power and then overall you can probably have two abilities maxed out you can get more than that during the game but it doesn't benefit you because you can only use two abilities against odium so i know i think it was like the second time i was trying to get like as many abilities as possible because i thought it would help me and then we got to the end and i was like oh you're only allowed to throw two of them dang it (laughs) i should have collected other things so that is just kind of one of those things of like you play and you learn and you go on to see like what's a the better strategy but this concept of collecting abilities or gaining abilities through the trials and challenges that you overcome sometimes like in act one there's a lot of inherited things for example there's a light eyes card and a dark oh, yeah. eyes card there's more traits because you don't have to fight for them you can just grab them exactly so it can just be like this is part of my identity identity my origin story is that i am a dark eyes now you could be a dark eyes surgeon or apprentice surgeon like kaladin was and that will give you a couple of starting abilities uh, i think in like the intelligence and maybe dexterity realms but you could also start as like a, a slave or that's one of the early cards is like trapped into slavery and you get different abilities because of different traits or challenges that you face throughout the game. Yeah, so just like a person starting out, <laughs> you already have some strengths and some weaknesses. Yes, and that is why cooperative mode is our current or most favorite version to play when you are of the goal of defeating Odium at the end. You can also play cooperatively to benefit each other's strengths and weaknesses yeah so that's another great aspect of this game or like something that you can choose to keep in mind if you want to while you play is if you want to work together with the people that you're playing with you kind of want to diversify the abilities that you have so that you don't have to compete with as many people for the cards that you want (laughs) yeah the competition in many respects is not only for point total at the end but also for the different cards traits and challenges that will benefit the abilities that you are trying to max out yeah so like if everyone at the table is trying to get wisdom challenge cards it's going to be pretty tough but if you diversify a little bit then you kind of all have a little bit more space so you can choose you know how competitive you want to make it and there are different quests as well so you have a bunch of like quest cards that will give you a different set of uh rules for that gameplay and there's one in particular that really fosters a cooperative play unite the radiance oh no not that one it's the one we played last time that incentivizes you to 
play good cards specifically for other players, not for yourself. Got you. I think that is Honor is Dead. Yeah. And it's like Kaladin and Adolin back to back. Yeah. Um, But that is exactly right. There are uh, the one I was talking about, Unite the Radiance. And these are like game rules kind of. That one, as it sounds, makes everybody want to take a Radiant card and be the strongest Radiant. But you're talking about one that is more cooperative. And I want to mention for our morally gray or outright (laughs) evil listeners, there are a couple of non-Radiant paths. It is not the norm. And I don't want to spoil them just in case anybody wants to find out exactly. But there are all the Radiant orders and then a couple of extra ones thrown in there for those who want something a little bit different in their life yeah that's another thing that i like about this game that i think mirrors uh, an aspect of the book even if you choose a non-radiant path you're like not necessarily penalized for choosing that path you still get points for Um, like for what's called tragedy in the game as well. So it's really well balanced. And like, even if you lose a challenge, you gain experience points. Um, So I think it's cool that it sort of celebrates the grayness and the vast uh, experience of life as the Stormlight Archive and like all of the Cosmere books do there's a really great balance between like you can be a good person and still have challenges and struggles and tragedy and have fought with your darker nature and you can still be a good person and do good things at the same time so that's an aspect that's brought into this game that i really love yeah the one is open to all experiences yes i think as we mentioned at the top the game has done something that I think is talked about and often is incorporated into board games, but in many respects is also kind of left out of a lot of board games. They go for just like simplicity or maybe cheapness. I don't know. But, and they also don't have the uh, source material maybe to work from, but the artwork of this game is truly beautiful. So all of this stuff that we're talking about realize that there are beautiful works of art for every single thing that we have mentioned. Uh, So when we're talking about like the route of a slave, that's depicted in like heart with a little boy like up against the bars and it's sad and they're like being pulled by a chole and you've never seen a chole this beautiful before. (laughs) But it's like... (laughs) Behind all of this artwork that was created for this game is a massive number of individual artists, more than we can give credit for. There's over 30 artists that were commissioned by Brother Wise Game. And what I think is really cool is that several of the artists are fan artists, probably seen before, you know, many years ago when these things were created just from the minds of readers and they are now part and uniquely tied into the Stormlight Archive forever uh, as official pieces of this board game. So tell me about one, just one, of the beautiful pieces of artwork from this game. It's so hard to pick just one because every time you turn over a card, you're just like, oh my gosh, and stare at it for like 30 seconds (laughs) before playing. But one of my favorites is definitely the card Fervent Prayer, which is a depiction of Novani burning the Thath glyph for Dalinar when she thinks that he may have died out on the plains when Sadius betrays him. It is just so beautiful and powerful, and it evokes the feeling that you get when you read that passage and her sort of desperate grief and denial and you see the glyph on fire and Navani just like sitting there hoping that Dalinar will come back and that there will be justice. It is definitely one of the most stunning cards and a scene that stands out and is definitely one that 
just burns an image in your mind, <laughs> pun intended. What I love about this specific interpretation is the way that the card is divided into the foreground, Navani in the midground, and then the background, and the way that the fire and the brightness of the justice glyph is just like burning brightly and is then creating all this dark smoke and then the darkness of the smoke is reflected in the background with these really dark storm clouds that but then there have, is a ray of yes, light yes and there's, then there's still these hope. rays of light that are shooting through like dark dark storm clouds and it's just this like very and then Navani's like right in the middle of those two things this darkness and this light both behind her and in front of her it's just a really really beautiful composition and I find it just a one of many of the images that you can just like stare at for a long period of time totally what is one of your favorite cards in the deck there are so many and it's hard because right now we're just scrolling through the wiki that has every single one of them uh, and they're all beautiful they are all wondrous I think that one that stands out for me and I remember it standing out in the game as well like when this uh, was turned over I think it's one of the cards that had the possibility to be dealt with me at the beginning so I got this as an option and I was just like wow I'm I'm taking this and it is the card for the stone ward order and it has an ancient stone ward certainly not a character that we have seen or been exposed to I, I think don't know it could be Telenolot it could be Telenolot the the herald of the stone wards because um, he's a just gigantic chocolate skinned man with dreadlocks and a he looks to me like Hephaestus from yeah. the Greek pantheon just like a uh, fire that looks like lava and molten is underneath and like filling out his shard plate and then his whole blade looks like it is made of just like it's basically a lightsaber, but cooler because it is <laughs> made out of just a moving lava. lava. It's a lava saber. Yeah, it lo- and it's pointed downwards like into, looks like some enemies right now. I think a person, yeah. Yeah. Um, He's but stabbing a person. <laughs> it looks like a lava fall that's just like coming to Ooh. a perfect tip. I just noticed there's like a thunderclast in the foreground too. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's a lot of death going on in this. It's not the happiest of cards, and some of them are very sad, but... Some of them are very sad, actually. It is a striking card, and definitely, when I got it, I was like, oh, I know what I'm doing this game. We are, we're, I'm just going to follow this card, uh, because, like, whatever else, I need to end up being need this to be dude. That. Yeah, exactly. And that is the whole game, right? That's like you're supposed to see something or or feel something and want to go in a certain direction. And then you just like build your character around that. And so that this card just epitomized what I was feeling in that moment uh, of just like, oh, I'm going to become that. I I don't, this is the end result. (laughs) And we're going to fight Odium. I think we also, that could have been our first victory against Odium. I don't, which was great. We lost the first two games. We we lost the. I think it might have been more than two, but it took us a while to beat Odium. And I think my Stone Ward play was uh, the route that led us to our first victory. (laughs) If not, then I'm just going to remember it that way. And then that'll become Write your own story. Exactly. Our next podcast is going to be our first Oathbringer reread podcast. We have been working our way through that We are going to break that book up into, we think, three episodes instead of two because it's really long and there's a lot. So right now we're planning on doing parts one and two, parts three and four, and then part five as its own standalone episode. So that's coming up. Look for that in your feeds soon if you are looking for other ways to get into the Cosmere and get pumped before Rhythm of War comes out. There are some pretty cool articles available on Tor.com, the publisher. There is a series on Cosmere food, Cosmere cuisine. 
that is super interesting if you want to uh, tour some Cosmere foods. And then there's also a series that a fan brought to my attention, which is a sort of introduction to a bunch of different aspects of the Cosmere, like intro to Rashar, intro to animals on Rashar. So that's another way if you want sort of a, a brush up, if you haven't been able to do a reread, that's a good resource as well. We will post as many of these links in the show notes. You're welcome to flip over and click on those links, see some of these cards, check out some of these great creations of the fans of the Cosmere, and we will be back soon with Oathbringer Review. We should say also we've gotten a lot of questions about the Rhythm of War uh, preview chapters that have started being released and questions about if we're going to be talking about those at all. We are not. For Oathbringer, Tyler, you read the preview chapters. I did not. I am the kind of person who likes to wait until I can get the whole thing and then just read the whole thing. And I wanted it too much. And they were giving <laughs> out these like delicious little morsels. Yeah. I will just, my own opinion is now, having done that, is that it made the beginning of the book very feel very disjointed for me, where I needed to and wanted to and enjoyed going back and starting over anyways and just kind of reading it all at once. It's just a little bit like too long, unless you had planned something like to save it all up for just like the week before and then right as the book came out you perfectly timed it so that you could just continue reading and it was all at once like that yeah because there is kind of a pace and a momentum yes, when you 100%. read a book and so if you are only reading a couple chapters at a time you're not really able to get into that flow of the story so anyway that is our personal opinion and the way that we will be approaching it. I know that there are other places that are going to be talking about those preview chapters. Those are available. Which means that this will remain a Rhythm of War spoiler-free podcast until we specifically say <laughs> that there will be spoilers for Rhythm of War. Yes. So our hashtag all spoilers is modified at the moment. Exactly. We are. And we'll place that also in the show notes. <laughs> Everything will be laid out as clearly as possible. Brooke, can you take us away? Until next time, life before death. Strength before weakness. Journey before destination. <laughs> <laughs>